Good evening and welcome to Monday Night Calculus on this wonderful President's Day. I've got Steve Kokoska and Tom Dick uh, here once again. My name is Curtis Brown and I'm hosting this evening. Uh, I just really want to welcome you and, and so glad that all of you are joining us. I see several folks out there that we recognize in the chat. Uh, so I just want to um, ask you again to go ahead and uh, put your comments in the chat, ask questions. I'll be sure to try to pass those on to Steve and Tom as they get things going. Uh, also, um, at the end of the session, I'll be putting my uh, email address uh, in the chat so that you can uh, email me and I will set you up with a professional development uh, certificate. I hope that there are some students on. I know last week we or two weeks ago we had a gr pretty good sized group of students on asking some questions. So that was really good. And if they're not, uh, maybe they'll join uh, us later on. So uh, Steve, why don't you take it away? Okay, you have to allow me to share, Curtis. Oh, I do. All right, I'll do that. I'll make sure that everybody can uh, everybody can share really quick. There we go. You good? How's that? Okay. Yep. All right. Let me see if I can make this just a little bit bigger. Looks great. And let's try that. Okay. Here we go. Well, a special, a special hello to our friends in Canada tonight, Curtis. And uh, we might also have some special guests, I understand, from Parsippany, New Jersey tonight. So that's terrific. We're going to talk about differential equations and slope fields, one of my favorite topics. And also, I, I think kind of a neat topic for technology. I think Tom has some really cool stuff uh, this evening. So I'm going to start out, as usual, by looking at the problems that we assigned for homework. I hope you did these, Curtis. Uh, I did not. I took oh, the day no. off. Oh, I did, no. I, I took the day off. We, My son and I went bowling. And, oh, my gosh. Uh, Curtis. <laughs> oh, minus, minus five. I mean, <laughs> I'll try to answer what I can on the fly, but... Uh... All, right. All right. Well, we frequently see a question or two like this on the exam, often uh, in the multiple choice portion, where we're given a differential equation, and we're asked to match the uh, slope field, to match it with a slope field. So how do you do these in general? Well, you kind of look for clues in the differential equation. Remember that a slope field really is just giving us little line segments that represent the slope of the tangent line at that particular point in the plane. We can use this slope field. Remember, if we have an initial condition, we can use this slope field to sort of trace out what a solution curve might look like. But for now, what we're trying to do is to match the differential equation with the slope field. So what I'm going to try to do is to pick out some some specifics here, some clues, some things that I might look for to help me identify which slope field goes with which differential equation. So let's take a, take a look at A. The first thing I notice in part A is that there is no X on the right-hand side of that differential equation. <laughs> so that means as X varies here, as X moves from left to right, the line segments should remain the same because they only depend upon y. Another thing that I notice is, well, when is that differential equation or when is y prime going to be zero? And that'll occur when y is equal to three halves. So that helps me zero in on this slope field. I can see that I have horizontal line segments here at y equal three halves. I can see that as I move left to right, my line segments are the same because they don't depend upon X, only depend upon Y. Above that sort of line, Y equal three halves, as we plug in values of Y, the slopes get bigger negative. And yes, I can see that in the slope field. As I look below that line, as I plug in values of Y, the slopes get bigger positive, and I can see that as evident in the slope field. So I think I can identify that differential equation with the slope field in number two. That's pretty good. Let's take a look at B. Well, in B, the differential equation depends on both X and Y. 
And so I'm looking for clues here. So I'm going to sneak back down here a little bit. And forgive me, Curtis, I'm going to rewrite this just to make it a little bit easier for me. So the differential equation is y prime is equal to y times x plus 2. Here's what I see for clues there. I see that when y is equal to 0, the derivative would be 0. So the slope field should have horizontal line segments along the x-axis. It's a little difficult to see, but they are there. And when x is equal to minus 2, y prime would also be equal to 0. So I should have horizontal line segments when x is equal to minus 2. Here they are, going up in a vertical line there. And this differential equation, this y prime varies with both x and y. As x and y increase, the derivative or the slope should increase. A little difficult to see here, but as we look in quadrant one, that concept, that idea, that relationship is indeed true. So this differential equation goes with the slope field in three. While I'm here down in four, part C here was a differential equation. Y prime is equal to X minus Y plus one. Well, okay, what sort of clues might you see there, Curtis? Anything by chance? Any clues that we could pick up in this differential equation that would help us identify four as the slope field? Certainly, it depends upon both x and y, but there's sort of a tip-off here, I think, that tells, it that tells us that this is the slope field. Do you see it there by any chance? Anybody out there who could put that in the chat? What's sort of a tip off here for us? Hmm. Anything at all? Anything you can connect that differential equation with that slope field? Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, I was talking to you, Steve. I promise, I really was. <laughs> Is there um, anything there? I, well, my my response was going to be, I'm going to wait for uh, folks in the chat. Uh, to talk about that. Okay. Uh, and Wanda just said zero slopes when y equals x plus one. Well, that's an excellent observation. I like that one. I like that a so lot. That's a good uh, observation there. That's a good observation sort of down this diagonal right here. That's an excellent observation. I see another one maybe a little more subtle but what happens when x is equal to y along the line i was that was where i was headed was it looked like we had uh y we had slopes of one where exactly x to y exactly so that was where my mind was gonna go wanda noticed the the other one which is even cooler yep yeah and so in fact this is the slope and beth of beth noticed this one that i was just gonna say very uh, good when x and y are the same y prime is one Excellent. So this is the slope field that goes with that differential equation. And let me arrow back up here a little bit. I think we had one left, sine x, cosine y. Um, I guess I'm looking for tip-offs there. I'm looking for where the horizontal line segments are. And let's see, when x is equal to zero, the sine of zero would be zero. So we should have horizontal line segments right there along the y-axis. And indeed, we do. And we seem to also have some horizontal line segments right there and right there. What do you suppose those two values are for y, Curtis? Any chance on that one? On which one? Does that make sense? Either one of these. It looks like along that horizontal line. Oh, and sure. Horizontal line a little bit below that, or sort of symmetrical with the x-axis. They tend to be horizontal Pretty also. Why is that, I wonder? What's the value of y there? They got a three halves and a negative three halves. So. Almost, almost. That's sure what it looks like. It looks an awful lot like that anyway. What do you suppose it is, though? Not quite three halves, but how about a trigonometric value in there somewhere? Oh, man, like I don't a, know. Like it's a pi good. over two? Lead me on that. Minus, pi over two, that'll work. Minus pi over two, yeah. There we go. Catherine got me on. Got, Catherine's got me backed up. Beautiful. Beautiful. 
All right. So those are some good examples, I think, Curtis, of matching DEs with slope fields. And again, I think you'll see one of those in the multiple choice portion of the exam coming up. And let's see if we can solve some of these differential equations. What I'm going to do is to solve some of these in general. These, are, these do not have an initial condition, but I'm going to point out, I think, I, I hope, uh, some important ideas here. So the only way to solve a differential equation that students are responsible for is separation of variables. They may know some other sophisticated techniques. If they intend to use those on the exam, in general, they've really got to make sure that they do the whole problem correct in order to get credit. So any differential equation can be solved using separation of variables. So let's see in this first one, I'm going to get all the y's on one side, all the x's on the other. That's what I did here. I'm going to take the antiderivative of both sides with respect to y on the left with respect to x on the right hand side. So this, I'm going to add a little bit more on the left-hand side. I've really got y to the minus 2. So I integrate that. It's y to the minus 1 over minus 1. There's my minus 1 over y. Antiderivative of e to the x is just e to the x. And don't forget the plus c here. Curtis, don't let me leave this problem without going off to the side here and making a comment. All right. And we're just going to solve for y now. Make sure that you use that constant c appropriately here. I'm going to take the reciprocal of both sides. I'm going to multiply by a minus one. And there's my solution for y here. I'm going to come back over here to this step. And I really shouldn't even write this down because it's not a good idea to write anything down that's wrong. But I'm going to show you a common error here, Curtis, if I can. A common error is to get to this point, take the antiderivative of both sides and write this as one over minus one over y is equal to e to the x. And many students do this and think, well, I'll worry about that constant at the very end. And so now what some students will do is they will take the reciprocal of both sides and multiply by a minus one. Mm -hmm. So they'll have y is equal to minus 1 over e to the x. And another way to write that, I guess, is minus e to the minus x. And then they'll say, oh, I'll throw in my constant c now. That's what we call, I think, in AP calculus lingo, a late c. And it's wrong. That's a very different function than the correct one over here on the left-hand side. And so we remind students Whenever they take the antiderivative of both sides, that's the time to introduce that constant C. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So I'll erase that just so nobody thinks that's the right way to do it. Let's take a look at this one. dy dx is equal to 2 plus the sine of x divided by e to the y plus 1, holy Toledo. Separation of variables, not too bad. We'll bring this whole expression to the left-hand side. We'll get the dx on the right. And this is actually a pretty easy integration on both sides, integrating term by term. We get e to the y plus y on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we get 2x. Let's see. Uh, antiderivative of the sine minus the cosine. And there's my constant plus c. And I'm going to have to stop there on that one because I don't think I can explicitly solve that for y. At least I don't see an easy way to do it. I tried this one in Mathematica, too, to see if I was missing anything. I can't get an explicit expression for y there. So this might be an interesting problem, although I didn't do this here, but this might be an interesting problem tomorrow morning in class to take a look at the slope field take a look at an initial condition and see if you can get some sort of curve here. See what that solution curve might look like. Cool. All right, let's try this one. I think a part C for me, Curtis, is kind of old school. This is a way that I learned solving differential equations a few years ago. Um, we can still solve a differential equation this way, but many of the problems on the free response portion are initial condition problems. And so we don't usually do this one technique here that I'm going to show you, uh, but let, let's attack this one and see what happens. 
I'm going to separate the variables. I'm going to bring this expression with the y plus one over to the left hand side. There's the dx on the right hand side. I'm going to integrate both sides with respect to y on the left, with respect to x on the right hand side. This is a log of the absolute value of y plus one. I'm going to urge you, students out there especially, don't forget that absolute value. We've got to deal with that. We've got to figure out how to deal with that in some way if it's an initial condition problem. On the right-hand side, we've got an x squared. Well, 2x squared divided by 2, the 2's cancel, plus x, and there's the constant c. So how do we solve this for y? How do we get an expression for y? Well, let's see. We can exponentiate both sides here. So on the left-hand side, we're left with the absolute value of y plus one. And on the right-hand side, we've got e to this expression, x squared plus x plus c. And with properties of exponents, we can write this as e to the c times e to that expression, that leftover expression. Now, remember this in solving DEs, how do I get rid of that absolute value? Well. The absolute value of that y plus one is either plus or minus the argument. And so we attach a plus or minus to that e to the c. And now we treat that as one separate constant, c sub one. And now I'm almost done. I solve this for y. I bring a one to the right-hand side, so it's a minus one. And there's my expression for y. So that type of problem, I think you're more likely to see in a multiple choice portion of the exam. But that's sort of an old school way of solving for y in terms of x and a way to sort of eliminate or deal with that absolute value. Cool, any questions out there, Curtis? You still with me? Still with you, Steve. I haven't mm -hmm. seen any questions uh, come up on on this. All right. Well, we've got a couple on this next one. Let's try. We've this. got a couple on this next one. You oh. betcha, we do. <laughs> I'm going to add a little bit off to the side. Well, I'm going to make sure you start asking those questions of Tom. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, I will. Let me add a little bit off to the side here. We like to sprinkle these problems in. At least part of this problem has a BC topic in it. So let's see. Let's see if we can find the solution to this differential equation that satisfies this initial condition, that is, that y of 0 is equal to 1. So all right, it's got to be separation of variables. So I get all the y's on the left, all the x's on the right-hand side. It's pretty easy to find an antiderivative here. That's just 1 half y squared. But how do you find an antiderivative over here? How do you do that one? It's not integration by inspection. It's not an integration by substitution. In fact, it's an integration by parts. And let me just add a little bit more off to the side. I think we can integrate that by parts with u equal to x and dv what's left over. So we get the cosine of x dx. So du would be equal to just dx, and v would be equal to the integral of the cosine, which would be the sine of x. So you can kind of see the integration by parts. There's u times v, x sine x, minus the integral of v du, so minus the integral of the sine, which is minus the cosine, the minus signs cancel. OK, I feel pretty good about this. There's the plus C, and here's another good, I think, tip for the exam in solving this type of a problem. As soon as you take the antiderivative of both sides and you have dealt with the constant, that is, you've included that constant C, now is the time to use that initial condition. Yes, it is true that you could try to proceed and solve for Y in terms of X, but in general, it's much easier and okay, a test taking tip, easier to get some points if indeed you use the initial condition at this point. 
So let's see, y is equal to one, there it is. X is equal to zero. There we go, what happens here? I've got a one half on the left. That's out, cosine of zero is one. So solving for C, I've got a one half minus one. C is equal to minus one half, okay? I'm gonna go back up here. I'm gonna plug in a minus one half for C. I'm gonna try to solve this for Y. Let's see what happens here. What did I do here? Oh, okay. I let C be equal to minus one half and I multiplied through by two. That's where I've got the two X sine X plus a two cosine of X. And now I take the square root of both sides and there's my expression for Y, pretty cool. Now, just to check this, I created a slope field down below. Here's the initial condition, y of zero is equal to one. And remember, we should be able to follow this slope field and produce the solution curve. I believe that's what this curve looks like. There is some nice symmetry here. And I'm gonna add a little bit off to the side here as a question, not necessarily to be answered right now, but one you should think a little bit about, is what's the domain here? It's been a while since we've asked for the domain on the AP calculus exam. I have to go back a number of years, and I'm sure Mark Corrali will remember how many years ago that was. But you know what? You can almost feel another one of those coming up here, where the student would have to think about and actually write what is the domain of that solution. So I'll have you think about that a little bit. Tom, do you have some technology to add in here? Uh, sure, Steve. Okay, I'm yeah. going to stop sharing. Okay. There you go, all yours. All right. I'm going to actually try to share on a couple of different platforms here. I'll start out with uh, TI Inspire. Okay. And just want to make uh, folks aware that you uh, do have a slope field plotter on the Inspire that's built in. So I'm just going to insert a graph here and um, go to my menu and change from the usual function plotter. I'm going to go down to graph entry edit and See at the very bottom there is differential equation. You won't see actually the word slope field, but the differential equation plotter, that's the right context for us to use a slope field. So let's do that. Uh, and you can see the syntax here. We got y1 prime. I'm going to use the example uh, Steve just looked at. Um, I think it was like x cosine, x times cosine of x and divided by y. Correct. So let's uh, let's give that a shot. So I'll put in x times. I'll just type it in cosine of x. And then here's a point I did want to make here. We want to divide by y. But notice that uh, because we could have a kind of a library of different differential equations we were we might be wanting to look at in succession, this one's labeled y1. And so we want to refer, if we're dividing by y, I want to actually refer to it as y1. So that's, I think, the, the key thing that sometimes people trip up on. So there it is, x times cosine x divided by y1. And let's uh, enter that and see what kind of thing we get. Ah, there we go. There's the slope field. And you. this one's a, a little bit, um, well, I don't know how it compares. It may be a little less dense than the one Steve had. If you want to uh, change the density of these things, uh, you can go back to your equation and over here to the side, uh, this dot, dot, dot right here says edit parameters. Uh, we can, let's see, let me scroll down here. 
And I think it's at the very bottom. Oh, here it is, field resolution. This is a way that you can control kind of how fine your lattice is for slope segments. So I'm gonna, it says 14, I think that's the default. I'm gonna double it to 28. Do an okay. Pretty cool. And now you see it's a much finer kind of slope field sample there. So, and you can, you know, change your plotter uh, without losing the slope field, change it back to function and then plot a function that you think might be a solution to see how, how well it fits. Can you, uh, Tom, just for the heck of it, uh, can you change X min and max here? Uh, just to see if it looks like mine, do a minus three to three in both directions? Sure. All right, let's see, let's go to the menu again. I'll we'll go to window and zoom, All window settings. And um, now your screen that you showed in your illustration, Steve, was actually kind of in a square. Yes, it was. That's correct. So I might I might go from minus four to four. Gotcha. Yeah. Just to uh, make the slopes a little bit more close to square. Okay. And then I'll do y min from negative three to three. Okay. And the X scale and Y scale, that's just where the, the tick marks are. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't really need to bother with that. Okay. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, and that looks, uh, this one's actually maybe a little bit finer than the one you had in terms of density. Yeah. Yeah. Matt, Tom, let me ask one other question. When you were entering in the uh, differential equation, it looked like there was a spot there for an initial condition. Sure enough. Yeah, so I'll go back there. And the initial condition that's optional is here, x, x0, y10. So if we enter that, see, I think your initial condition was y of zero equals one. So I would right. put zero for x and then one for y. Now, what it's going to do is use a numerical method to try to approximate a curve. Uh, and in the parameters there, if people, they might have saw there was an Euler. Uh, thing came up when I had the parameters up there. You can choose yep. between Euler and there's another method called uh, Runga Kutta that is finer, but it's basically just uh, trying to approximate a curve that would go through this point and would follow the slope field. So let's see what happens when we graph that. Ah, this is yeah. really nice. Yeah. Because it's, I think, underlining your concern about domain. Yep. Uh, th this uh, method, uh, it does not, it, it's not smart in knowing what the domain should be uh, or, or any restrictions on the domain. So it's going to keep marching out to the left and to the right from your initial condition point even if it's crossing a place where the differential equation no longer is valid or uh, maybe is undefined, something like that. And so that's why you're seeing, we're, we're actually on pieces of other solution curves that satisfy other initial conditions because we've actually went too far to the left and right. So that's a, uh, that was a nice thing to ask for. But it, I can see that the part that did, um, I mean, some piece of this looks really, really similar to the one you had. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, Tom, when you uh, go back and enter a function in a y equal menu, this okay. maintains this slope field and it will sort of overlay on this? Uh, yeah, let's give it a shot. So I'm going to do a graph entry edit and now I'll bring up function. Okay. And notice the slope field's still ah. there, but now it's letting me uh, put gotcha. in a function. Gotcha. I'll try a uh, function that uh, you had. Let's see, it was like two times x times, oops, got ahead of myself there, a sine of x, I think. Yep. Uh, plus 
And my memory is not that good, folks. I just have this on a sheet of paper near me. <laughs> <laughs> so. All um, right. I perfect. Perfect. Rid of all that. Let's see how that looks. Ah, oh, very nice. Pretty good. Yeah. Pretty and good. if you're wondering why the brown dots, that was from that uh, numerical solution. Yes. Uh, you can notice it's starting to stray a little bit off the blue path. That's because it's an approximation. And in fact, the further out we go from the initial condition, we start accumulating error. That, that's the explain that. And you can see our this solution definitely stops at a you know, two values. And it'd be interesting to figure out what those two values must be. What is that interval if that's valid? Uh, but again, these extraneous ones, this is because the numerical method has just kind of gone off the off the cliff, so to speak, and gotten on to other solution curves. So, yep. All right. Yeah. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Steve. Okay. Uh, All righty. And let me do a stop share. And I think it's back to you. Okay. Well, there's a part B here. I think there's a part B. There we go. Oops. There we are. So once again, we have a differential equation, an initial condition, and we want to see if we can solve this one. And uh, we have, uh, Tom and I were talking about this before we came on the air, and uh, there's some interesting things going on in this slow field, something that you should uh, try tomorrow morning at 8.05 before you start uh, AP Calculus class. So all right, let's see here. Let's see what happens. Uh, dy dx times the tangent of x is 3 plus y. I've got to separate the variables. I can bring the 3 plus y over to the left-hand side. I can divide both sides by the tangent. That gives me a cotangent over here. And I can take the antiderivative of both sides. So let's see. Don't forget the absolute value in the log. I've got the log of y plus 3, absolute value of y plus 3. Remember that the cotangent is the cosine of x divided by the sine of x. So let's see, I've got the derivative up top and the original function down the bottom. So that's a du over u. So on the right-hand side, I've got the log of the absolute value of the sine of x. And there's my constant plus c. Now, I won't go through all the gory details here, but I am going to use the initial condition now, y at pi over 6 is equal to 3. So I've got a y equal to 3. I think I can see the log of 6 over there. Log of the absolute value of the sine of pi over 6. Okay, that's a 1 half. And I think if I put all of this together and solve for c, I've got a log of 12. Holy Toledo. So now I'm going to go back here and see if I can solve this expression for y. You'll notice in this expression right here, there's the value of c, and I've taken away those absolute value symbols because when I plugged in the expression for x and plugged in the expression for y, the value for x and the value for y, the arguments were positive. So that tells me that I am on a part of a solution here where those arguments are positive. So, okay, I think I can actually solve this for y in terms of x. I think I did a little bit of simplification or a little bit of combining of terms on the right-hand side. Exponentiate both sides. Solve for y, and son of a gun, I've got a y equal 12 times the sine of x minus 3. Now, let's take a look at this curve here, this solution curve in the slope field. Here's the slope field that I produced. I think I produced this one using Mathematica. Here's the initial condition right there. And I think you can sort of follow that slope field and see this solution curve. And in fact, if you think a little bit about what that looks like, you're all familiar with their trigonometric functions and how to graph sine curves. So I see the amplitude there is 12 and it's shifted down three. Ah, but I've stopped this right here and right here. I believe, after thinking about this, 
that the domain is minus pi over two to plus pi over two. Yes, in looking at this expression, I can plug in any real value for x, but the domain here for this solution, I believe is minus pi over two to plus pi over two. So we're gonna add in a little bit of a question mark here. I wonder why that's true. And we'll leave that as sort of an open question. And here's a little bit of something else you can think about. As I look at this slope field, I see some horizontal line segments here, right there, and, and I'm going to add in right there where y is equal to minus 3. And it does sort of make sense to me. If you'll allow me, Curtis, I'm going to arrow up a little bit. I think I see that. Where y is equal to minus 3, I have a 0 on the right-hand side. I think I can see that y prime would be equal to 0. But I'm a little concerned about, and I'll just circle this, I'm a little concerned about what's going on here, what's going on along the y-axis. And I think what we'll do is we'll let you think about that a little bit. You can kind of see a similar pattern over here. Oops, I'm sorry about that. You can see sort of a similar pattern here. You can see sort of a similar pattern here. And so if you think a little bit about that, and think about, well, maybe there's some repetition here. You might be able to reconcile what's going on with that slope field. Cool. Tom, did you want to do one with the 84 now, or you want me to do one more problem? We can take a look at one with the 84, sure. All right. Okay. So I'll stop sharing. There you go. All right. And uh, so I'm pulling up an 84 here. So the uh, TI-84 doesn't have a slope field uh, functionality built in, uh, but there's a lot of folks who've pro written, uh, they're not real um, extensive programs, but they, they do the trick. Uh, I've got a couple of ones loaded on to, to this 84. I'll show you uh, how it works. First of all, the, the particular programs I have for slope field, uh, they expect your differential equation. We need some place to have it stored, and Y1 is where it expects to find that. So I'm going to put in a really simple uh, differential equation. I'm going to assume that my Y prime, again, remember, I'm going to store my Y prime in Y1. My y prime is actually involves both x and y. So I'm going to say, let's look at the negative x divided by y. I'm going to claim that this is a, a derivative that actually comes up pretty early in the course when you're first doing implicit differentiation. I, I think almost a lot of people's very first example they look at with implicit differentiation is they'll take the equation for a circle. That's not a function graph, but you can still find the derivative in terms of x and y. And this is what the derivative turns out to be for uh, a circle centered at the origin. Uh, so I'm going to plot the slope field for this. Uh, what I'll do is uh, got that entered in. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Let's see. <laughs> I think I hit the wrong key there. So let me clear that out real fast and just recover what I had before. Negative X over Y, and then I'm going to quit. Go to the calculator screen. Now I'm going to go to programs, and I have some slope field programs here. There's two of them, SLP, FLD, and these are, have two different kind of densities to them. I'm going to pick the second one because it has a more of a difference. It plots more line segments. And here we go. And remember um, where I said that particular uh, derivative came from, it came from uh, finding implicit derivative for a circle. And so if we solve that differential equation using a slope field or we see curves that satisfy, it looks like concentric circles about the origin. So it's Very kind of cool. neat. 
And just like uh, with on the Inspire, uh, this slope field will stay there. I can go to the uh, uh, function plotter and then go ahead and plot some actual function. Uh, I think what I'll do, I'll try, how about uh, square root of nine minus x squared. That's the top half of a circle of radius three. And let's graph that and it should graph it on top of my slope field. Looks pretty cool. So very cool. So there's a lot of things you can do very similarly on the 84. It does require, you know, uh, downloading, getting a program on there or writing one of your own that uh, will add that functionality. But I think it's well worth it. This is one. Uh, I, I think this is the, of uh, all the programs that I have on for 84, this is the one I use the most would be the slope field program. Hey, Tom. Yes, sir. If you uh, email me that uh, program or those programs, uh, I think I can figure out a way to maybe put those programs into the uh, description for this uh, for this YouTube live event. Um, Fantastic, because they are on the TI website, but it's in uh, we, one would have to kind of look for sure where it's stored. I can, in. I can uh, get them into this uh, YouTube description, uh, yeah. and if you want to do that, send it to me, and I'll post them up there. The same time I put the teacher documents up there with the solutions. Sounds fantastic, Curtis. We'll do. All right. All right. I'll turn this back over to Steve now. Okay. Here we go. Beautiful. Okay. We've got a couple more problems here to finish up with. Here's another one, which is a, a differential equation with an initial condition. Once again, y of zero is equal to one. Looks a little complicated, but let's see what happens here. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this 2x to the right-hand side. And then let's see, I'm going to multiply both sides by the dx. I'm going to get that over there. I'm going to divide by this square root. So now I've got all the y's on one side, all the x's on the other. I think I've got a minus sign in there. I don't want to lose that. Antiderivative on the left-hand side, well, just the backwards power rule. So y to the fourth over four. On the right-hand side, excuse me, just a little bit more complicated, but a pretty straightforward u substitution with u equal to x squared plus one. And du would be equal to two x dx. I, I think you can see that. I know that your students are really good at this. So let's see, is that right? There's a minus two. Uh, there's the derivative. Yeah, okay, so it's going to be x squared plus 1 to the 1 half over 1 half. That's why we've got another 2 in there, and I've still got the minus sign. Yep, I feel pretty good about that. And there's the constant plus c. Okay, as usual, at this point, let's use the initial condition. y is equal to 1. There it is. x is equal to 0. So let's see, I've got a 1 fourth over there. And let's see, this is going to be a minus 2 times 1. So I've got to add 2 to find C. C is equal to 9 fourths. Yikes. Okay. All right. I'm going to go back up here. I'm going to plug in C equal to 9 fourths. I'm going to try to solve this expression for Y. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 4. So let's see, that's going to be a minus 8. That's going to be plus 9. And how do I solve this for y? Yikes, i got to take the fourth root of both sides. Holy Toledo, there's my expression for y. Well, I'm not satisfied with that. I want to check this a little bit. So here's my slope field that I produced. My initial condition was y of 0 is equal to 1. And if you follow the slope field, you get a curve like that. It's in blue, if you can see the colors. And I believe the domain here is that x is between plus or minus the square root of 17 over 8. Holy Toledo, where did that come from? Any ideas on that one? Wow, we better. We, we haven't had many answers in the chat here. I wonder where that yeah. one came from. 
we haven't had any very many answers in the chat i'm uh i am curious to see about uh where, about that where folks think that came from uh a little bit there well we'll leave that as an open question very good all right here's my last question for this evening curtis and it's got a couple of nice twists to it i think tom will have to help me a little bit with this I'm going to answer a couple of parts here in one. It says, first of all, here's this differential equation, cosine of x, y prime, excuse me, is equal to cosine of hey, x. Hey, Steve, we do have an answer out there. Beth oh. uh, responded and said the initial uh, equation under the square root has to be greater than or equal to zero. In fact, that's true. That's very good. So you take nine minus eight times the square root of x squared plus one that must be greater than or equal to zero. And in fact, if you solve that, you'll get that X must be between plus or minus square root of 17 over eight. That's very good. Yeah. Excellent. Man. Excellent. I hadn't thought about the fourth root needing to be positive. What's inside must be positive. Yeah. Very good. Excellent. All right, back to this one. Y prime is the cosine of X divided by the cosine of Y. I'm going to use technology to sketch this slope field. This might be a nice one, too, to take a look at on the 84 or the TI Inspire. It says, use the slope field to sketch a solution curve that satisfies the initial condition. Y of pi over 2 is equal to 0. Well, I have a question about this. So here's, I think, pi over 2, 0. And what I did is I tried to follow the slope curve, uh, the slope field, and draw this solution curve. And the question is, first of all, why did I stop right there on the left and the right? Why didn't I continue drawing this solution curve? Hmm. That's a good one. Seems like I could keep going here. It seems like I can continue to follow those little line segments. I wonder why we stopped there. Hmm. Well, let's see if we can solve this differential equation with this initial condition. Here's what I did. You got to stop where the cosine is equal to uh, cosine of y is equal to zero. Okay. I, I, I'm pulling that from the chat there, Steve. I'm okay. Can you can anybody see why you would stop there just by looking at the slope field? If we continue to use the slope field, what would happen with that curve? Uh, can anybody see that? Solution curve should be a function. Exactly. And so if we follow the follow the slope field, nice crystal, we would go this way and son of a gun. That wouldn't be a function. That wouldn't be the graph of a function. That's excellent. Excellent. Figures our friends from Canada would know that. Yep. Yep. All right. So how do we solve this one? We get all the Ys on one side. We get all the Xs on the other. I've got, let's see. As I integrate both sides, I've got the sine of Y is the sine of X. There's my constant C. Whoops. Where's the pen? There it is. There's my constant C. I'm going to use my initial condition, which was x is equal to pi over 2, y is equal to 0. So let's see, the sine of 0 is 0, sine of pi over 2, 1. So c is equal to minus 1. Plugging back in, sine of y is equal to the sine of x minus 1. I think with a little bit of luck, I can solve that for y. I get y is equal to the arc sine of the argument sine of x minus 1. Okay. I think the domain for this one is zero to pi. Um, I think I can see that or justify that a little bit by looking back up here at my slope field, looking at the curve that I drew. It sure looks like zero to pi. But I think, Curtis, you mentioned earlier, at least hinted at why this might be zero to pi. You have to come back up here, I believe, and take a look at, whoops, I'm sorry, the original differential equation yeah um, what values can y take on here what values can x take on and i think you'll see that we have to have an x between zero and pi 
in order for this to work. And down at the very bottom, there was one other thing I was, oh, it says in part D to add the solution in part C. And in fact, it would look very similar to that was one other thing I wanted to add here. What the heck was it? Oh, I know what it was. <clears throat> Let's see here. If I just take a look at this expression, y is equal to arc sine, sine of x minus one, what's that argument have to be? In order for me to be able to take an arc sine, what's that argument have to be? Hmm. Mm. Can you characterize that argument? What does that have to be? Give me an angle. Oh. Sign is something. So what does that have to be inside there? Zero to two. No, don't think about that. Just think about this whole argument for a minute. What does that have to be? Negative one and one. Very good. So minus one less than or equal to the sine of x minus one, less than or equal to one, very good. So now what happens if I add one to everything, to each side of this inequality? I get zero is less than or equal to the sine of x is less than or equal to two, which is true on zero to pi. That's sort of the smallest domain where that's true that includes my initial condition. Oh, these differential equations are tricky. Yeah. Very good. All right, Curtis, that's all I got for this evening. There's a lot of good stuff there on DEs and slope fields. Tom's done some cool stuff. Any other lingering questions out there? I haven't seen any lingering questions out there. Um, so I think all I will say is that, um, I'm going to, I will go ahead and sign us off here. I'm going to put my uh, email in the chat. If you are interested in getting a, um, a uh, PD certificate uh, for an hour of uh, professional development, uh, I'll make sure that you get a link for that. If you email me uh, at curtis at ti.com. Uh, and other than that, um, I think we can go ahead and sign off. Thank you for joining us this evening. And we will see you in two weeks. I'll make sure to have those student documents up. And uh, I'll also get those programs up in the chat, or sorry, not in the chat, in the description uh, for this particular video. So be watching for those. You can come back and, and uh, pick those up from the description. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thanks.